Hello, everyone. I'm here for one of my stories. This is Lindsay Dunn. And today I'm joined by the Void Twins. That is Steve Intervoid Barnes and Nate Voidmaster Dunn. Hello, gentlemen. Howdy, howdy. Hello there. Hi, y'all. Or should I say, Great Scott. I've been driving around Scotland in my white van looking for prey. I mean, nice men to spend time with. You guys seem nice. What have you been up to? Driving around in my big white truck, <laughs> dropping plants off instead, though. <laughs> yep, I've been driving around in my white truck as well. I have a white truck and nobody can get in it because my computer laptop like base takes up the entire passenger seat. So no one can sit in there. So sorry, y'all. No passengers mm. allowed in this truck. <laughs> <laughs> so today we are going to be talking about the A24 film Under the Skin, which is directed mm -hmm. by Jonathan Glazer and written by Glazer and Walker Campbell, loosely based on a book by Michael Faber that came out in the year 2000. The movie mm -hmm. is starring Scarlett Johansson, Adam Pearson, a racer named Jerry Mc, Jeremy McWilliams, and many other unknown <laughs> actors. For many of them, this is their only credit on IMDb. And they have such special characters' names, too. I got actually a warm feeling because I thought, hey, this is what Steve and Nate did. Like they have names like first victim, second victim, the leering man, <laughs> the nervous man, the quiet man, and the logger. So the very distinctive names. Um, Ooh, the logger sucks. Wait a second. I want to. <laughs> I want to say that real quick. The logger sucks. <laughs> we don't like the logger. <laughs> so this is only the seventh uh, movie we put out. Um, I'm gonna. I'm gonna take a pause here in a minute, Steve. But um, only the seventh movie that came out uh, by A24, and many critics named it the best film of 2014. BBC put it number 61, and their greatest films of the 21st century. So it's it's got quite a following and people really like this movie. In fact, there was an actual nonfiction book made called Alien in the Mirror, which goes scene by scene and dissects the movie extensively. Steve, you wanted you had something you wanted to say. Oh, you were talking about how this is a lot of people's only film credit. And I read that they kind of did some renegade filming with this movie, like they filmed it similar to how they do like Jackass or Impractical Jokers, where Scarlett Johansson was in a van with a film crew driving around Scotland, um, talking to people like, for example, that guy, Andy, who had the tattoo of his name, Andy, on his arm. And then somebody yells and catches his attention. Um, they had a film crew to film just random people on the street mm -hmm. and they would have them do like, you know, release forms afterwards. Um, not everybody, of course, because the victims and some actors were hired, but anybody that she is, that, that was her job for a couple of days was to drive around and ask people directions and talk to people in the street. Yeah, somehow they, they didn't recognize that it was Scarlett Johansson because- Some people did, you can tell. Yeah. Like there's the guys in the white car who like get all excited and yell and like speed off. I kind of think that they recognize her because they all look kind of excited. And mm. I think that might've been one of those moments, I, I'm guessing- I mean, I don't know for sure which scene was which, but that's how they filmed those scenes. <laughs> how, did, how did we um, come across like this movie? Like we, we narrowed this down based on um, just, a, just random selections, right? Well, let's, let's tell them why we decided that we were going to do mm. this and why I got brought back. <laughs> okay. Call it a comeback. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, I miss podcasting with Steve and then I only did one with Lindsay but it was yeah. fun so I was like we should do something <laughs> and then I don't particularly remember which one of you said what about a movie yeah and then Lindsay made fun of me because I like cartoons <laughs> I was not, I was not making fun of you but yes yes I, I good natured about ribbing <laughs> <laughs> good natured ribbing that's right um and then we settled on sci-fi horror movie right there you other. go there you go and it there was a go. short short list of selections and then uh lindsay said this is the movie this is it this is what we're doing <laughs> she took she took the reins and said watch it she said it's a barn burner a and bar I was that's right 
I was sold. Barn burner. Oh, yeah. Well, I thought you had mentioned the movie Arrival. And I remember thinking, Mm -hmm. oh, maybe we're going to talk about the Arrival or we're going to do something similar to maybe do two movies side by side. Mm -hmm. And Steve put in the old chat bot to to (laughs) give him some movies that were like, Mm -hmm. uh, like that movie. And so this was one of the selections <laughs> and there were four or so movies that the, the chat bot, the, the holy chat bot selected. Man, a bot selected the them. movie for our podcast here. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> what a terrible realization. <laughs> and I remember watching this movie, you know, around when it first came out and really liking it. So Steve, you were, you were curious about my use of the word barn burner. Yes. Yes. What does that so, mean uh, to you? Did I use the word incorrectly? I, I think so. Um, when you say barn burner, I picture like a, uh, I picture just more of an action flick and fast paced and over the top, you know, mm-hmm. like, I don't know, this party's out of control. Uh, this movie was real. Like it reminded me of a, a genre of metal called funeral doom, which is real slow and like drawn out. And like one note will last for like three minutes, very <laughs> similar to how like one scene and like a rear view mirror will last for three minutes. It was a very long drawn out movie. And I thought it was more of a slow burn than a barn burner. Hmm. It's a slog. <laughs> it, was quite, it, it really was like um, the scene where they're, well, I feel like there's a lot of scenes where they're just looking out over the landscape and it's like, am I, I almost thought the movie paused at certain times. I was like, is this, <laughs> is it still going? The only thing that, the only thing that you're like, oh no, the movie is still playing is that whoever did the audio for this movie decided they were going to go to like the external mics. No one like, That's and they exactly turned, right. they turned everything up. They were like, the game's on 10. We want you to hear when the crickets like walk by. Yes. Uh, which I wasn't sure. And I'm glad that you say that you're agreeing with that, Steve, because I was starting to get worried that maybe something was wrong with my sound system or something was wrong with the TV or whatever it was. I was like, this just seems so loud. Like the wind is so loud. Yeah. Usually when you record audio, you try to get rid of all your bra- background noise and you only want to record the pertinent things like the, you know, the vehicle noises and the person's noises that they're making instead, like, yeah, all the background noises were turned up louder than like everything else. So you heard a lot of that, like road hu- room hiss and like road noises. And um, yeah, you're exactly right. And to a degree, I understand it because of, the concept of the movie of trying to understand like being on a new planet and you know how when you're in a new area you soak in all that information but just for the whole movie everything was just so loud I was like I get it but at the same time it was quiet down <laughs> but all that's, right. that's an sorry. interesting statement that that you said just quiet down because I was thinking I think about how quiet like the word one of the words I would use to describe the movie is quiet so you were talking about uh, the sound the sound design and how how off-putting this this is great stuff I I love that I talked to you guys and you noticed this audio stuff in fact this is sort of getting off topic of the film for for just a second but as an aside yeah. I really think your your you your eventual podcast about movies should be about sound because Steve makes all these really interesting statements. Like when we were talking about dark, he says this movie is heavy metal and it reminds me of this <laughs> aspect of it. And then this movie is like, I think he says he's gonna be talk about later how it's like an experimental music band. And I think that you guys should do a, a podcast about this movie is this genre of music. And so you can Ooh. teach people about music genres at the same time as you're talking about a movie and also things like sound design, which 
I don't didn't notice I wouldn't have noticed like oh it's in the externals and all this I mean that's very interesting stuff and I'm I'm interested in sound because I like soundtracks and stuff like that but anyway that is my pitch for what for your guys's uh pot movie podcast should be <laughs> that'd be very we'll unique and different yeah yeah it's in the contention right now yeah. switching gears a little bit mm -hmm. but I'm still going to what we were talking about before which is this movie and we're talking about how slow it is and how it's maybe not a barn burner. Um, I watched it in two different settings and I had two different experiences with it. The first time I watched it, uh, I was home by myself and I think I started watching it around 7 p.m. And, you know, just watched the whole movie, basically. Um, I would get up, you know, I take smoke breaks outside, then come back inside, continue watching. But, you know, I experienced the whole movie in that setting. And that's, you know, that was my primary watch. Then I watched it today. I wanted to watch it again to have it fresh in my mind. So it was like my schedule was like work, watch the movie, cut the grass, podcast. So like having like the movie like to watch before I was cutting the grass, it really made those long drawn out scenes very long and drawn out. So I'm like, I need to be mm. cutting the grass and they're just looking at the sunset for five minutes. What is happening? <laughs> so yeah, you do get different experiences depending on your mood and what you're up to that day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think when I said barn burner, I was thinking about the mental, a mental barn burner. Um, like when I use that word, okay, it means fair. it kind of makes, it's kind of like a, almost like a scorched earth movie, even though it's, yes, it can be slow and drawn out and many pauses. The woman is taking these men to this secret bad place to like, basically make them into meatballs and um hope everybody knows this is a spoiler full podcast it's a movie that is very disturbing and it's like it's not an easy fun watch it's getting at some really heavy stuff but doing it in a very artistic way yeah so I'm, I'm using that word the same way I would use like watching Midsommar is a barn burner for me because okay okay I mean it ends in destruction and annihilation and this movie ends also in many ways in annihilation and um it's not like you can go well that was nice you know I experienced it and I have hope for the world now I mean it's a very bleak movie and so it's it it burns my soul I guess is maybe what I meant by that hmm it's bleak but I'm glad I watched it though. I, that's what I wanted to say. Cause like Nate was like, I mean, early, I don't know. I'm well, Nate will give his own opinion later. I'm not going to yeah. spoil that. <laughs> um, but I'm glad I watched it. I mean, I, I took some things away from it and I'm glad I got to like, I don't know. I researched a couple of people from this movie and I'm glad that I did. Before we move forward with getting really deep into like who the director was and who the actors are mm -hmm. I just want to you know my first question really was overall how did this movie work for you did it get under your skin and I know we're <laughs> already kind of talking about that but your overall impressions of the movie Nate we're getting you didn't it didn't really work for you so much but is there anything that did work for you um I I think <clears throat> I think if you want to just look at some nice scenery and go for a walk without actually leaving your house with Scarlett Johansson, <laughs> this is a good movie to do it with. Um, I thought that the scene where they're floating in the black ooze is cool. Or, or are you more specifically talking? did it make me feel some kind of way? Mm -hmm. um, no, <laughs> quite, <laughs> quite, quite frankly, no, it was, um, I read, I read a couple different things that I thought were kind of interesting. Um, like someone said, one of the things that I read, and I mean, I, I hope this doesn't like, rattle any chains or anything like that to anybody but someone said that this is a good analogy as to how an autistic person begins to hmm. um 
like a severely autistic person would begin to understand and experience the world. Hmm. I buy that a hundred percent. And I was like, okay. I was like, that's interesting. I was like, that is, that is, I guess a way to, that is a positive that you could take away from this movie. But I guess if you're just looking at it from face value, then no, not so much for me. (laughs) Do you like some of the imagery though? Um, yeah, but, um, yeah, like your background, the <laughs> the the makeshift tool music video background <laughs> thing from floating in the water. Yeah, and the the meat slide. Oh yeah, the red meat slide. <laughs> meat I like that a lot too. <laughs> the meat slide. Yeah, reminded me of Pink cool. Floyd the Wall kind of a little bit. Yeah. So those were yeah. cool. Yeah. Any other overall impressions for you, Steve? Like, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, sure. Um, it absolutely did get under my skin. I think I felt more a little bit. Like, I really cringed a lot. Like when they were underwater and the guy like did the little ting and then they did the music <laughs> and then he became like skinny. Um, you know that affected me. It scared me. I didn't mm-hmm. like it. Um, there were a couple of like laugh out loud moments in this movie. And I think they were intended to be laugh out loud. I'm going to name two of them now. And that gets on, you know, for getting under your skin, like humor gets under your skin in a good way. So that's why I bring it up now. Um, When she ate the chocolate cake and then she gagged it out. That was hilarious. And then when she just uh, gazed at the guy to, for him to kiss her, and she just t- cocked her head back and just <laughs> stared at him. Didn't stare yeah. at him, start. It was so awkward and it was laugh out loud funny. Yeah. And I think it was meant to be like awkward slash funny. Um, the ending, like when the, when under the skin, you know, like the, the imagery of the real alien was, I thought that was a really cool image and like being into like metal stuff and that's really cool image and so that's i'm gonna take that with me so yeah those are the things that i'm gonna um walk away with under my skin Mm -hmm. and you Lindsay, how about you did anything like affect you a whole lot well i remember liking this when i was watching this movie this time i remember as i'm watching i'm like okay i don't i don't i like i think i liked it more the first time when i watched it Mm -hmm. um not necessarily because it was was slow because I kind of I kind of like that sometimes you know I like to fill in spaces and sit there and think well what's going on inside her head or why is she acting this way because her behavior is very strange and I was kind of looking at her like an experiment and I have you know some of the questions I'm going to throw out to you get get into some of this but it definitely you know it is an A24 film um, so I was, I was kind of looking at what makes an A24 film and you guys were right. sort of making fun of A24 movies before, but no, some of the characters making fun of A24 well, fans, yeah. <laughs> not the films themselves. The films are great. But these are <laughs> the films. kinds of movies that people kind of make fun of sometimes. Um, you know, there's like the words like elevated horror, um, but they're known for like ambiguity. That's the stuff bleakness. I like disruptive yep. storytelling so storytelling that kind of upsets the tropes and goes a slightly different way outbursts of violence and psychological dilemmas or drama you know there's yeah and then all of those characteristics um are definitely all over this movie they definitely have their brand and you know what mm-hmm. you're getting with an a24 movie mm-hmm. um but yeah, Nate, did you, were you going to toss something in there? I feel like I interrupted you. I was just going to make fun of the A24 fans. <laughs> so I'll yeah. keep that one, keep that down low. <laughs> That's for the group chat. We'll talk okay. about that later. I yeah. won't because I mean, I looked at like the list of A24 films, comedy specials, um, music videos, stand up comedy. And I like all of it, like all of it I've either seen or I want to see. And so like, I've already told Heather, I was like, next time we don't know what to watch, I'm just going to pull this Wikipedia list out. We're going to pick something from here because there's all this great stuff on there. Um, So I'm an A24 guy. I'm not going to, I'm not going to be gatekeepy or nerdy about it. I'm just going to have my fun and watch it and, you know, have my opinions. 
that's, yeah, what, I mean, I, that's, that's what I meant before when I was like, I'm not scared of anybody. I'll have my opinions out there, but I'm not going to psychoanalyze stuff too deeply. Well, yeah. I mean, what I'm just to clarify, what I'm getting at, getting at is like when, when you have that two and a half minute scene looking over the field, <laughs> we go, Oh my God, let's go <laughs> like somewhere else. It's not here. Like, I understand transitioning between scenes and things like that. Sometimes you need something like that. But for that duration with your, you know, your wind sound effect turned up to 11, like we, like to us, it's just infuriating. But an A24 fan goes, hmm, you just wouldn't get it, would you? And it's like, (laughs) it's like my brother in Christ. (laughs) We just watched the same screen for two and a half minutes. No, you wouldn't get it. You would you, simpleton. And it's like, I guess not, man. I don't really know if I want to, though. Like, let's go. This is like a version of, like, we. there's an unspoken fourth person that's here with us right now, and that is Heather, my wife, who also watched <laughs> this movie with me, and she's also been on the podcast and is part of our little clique here. And she, Nate, has basically said the exact same thing you were saying. Uh, She didn't last very long with this one. And she didn't have to sit there and watch it. So she chose not to. (laughs) She left. And so, you know, that tells you right there that of our little group here, half of them have that opinion. And um, (laughs) (laughs) and I like the slow movement, slow moments, too. Like, not when I'm waiting to cut the grass. But when I have plenty of time to enjoy a film, like I do like these slow moments and I do like the um, the suspense and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just I came from watching it today when I was in more of a hurry. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm curious um, if this movie reminded you of anything you've seen before, any of the shots, the filmmaking, the style. I had a couple I wanted to throw in. So mm-hmm. one of them is when the scene when the the biker or we call him the bad man, I guess is his name on IMDb. When yep. he's driving that motorcycle through the streets, I automatically thought of Girl with the Dragon Tattoo and, and oh, Elizabeth yeah. Salander dra- okay. driving through. And then all of the parts where they go into the black, the black goo room and mm-hmm. do what they do there. It made me think of Stranger Things, the show where they go into the upside down and they walk through and of course they're not naked, but, um, just mm-hmm. the imagery of sort of being in this yeah. void, basically. Void for the void for the void twins. Um, you know it. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Um, you know, so some some of that. And of course, there are other A24 films where they do this sort of what they like to call navel gazing, you know. Um, mm-hmm. so that there's a lot of that. But um but yeah, it's just those are a couple things that kind of came to mind. And I wondered if you guys had drawn any parallels with other movies you've seen before or shows. Um, something about the aesthetic of the whole movie kind of made me think of um, some of the earlier seasons of American Horror Story. Um, kind of like, meandering through the more more or less like meandering through the story and I don't know for some reason I guess it was just it's as simple as like the colors of everything Mm -hmm. uh reminded me of like uh oh what's the second season asylum I mean different time periods but Mm -hmm. I don't know but and the whole black goo like that that's a thing in American horror story and stuff like that that's really the only thing I could think of there was like a late 80s tv show i'm pretty sure sure i don't know i think it was called tales from the dark side i guess and it kind of had a very similar scenery and i remember there was one episode where there was like a black void room like this made me think of phantasm too how like there's those weird black hallways and like the original phantasm movie where that ball runs through um it reminded me of dark a little bit, Lindsay, when that scene, I mentioned this in our dark recap where Charlotte walks into that cabin and then like the darkness Mm. just kind of takes her. And then she like, you know, backs right back out of it again and heads out somewhere else. That reminded me of like when they walk into this black doorway and the blackness takes them. So those are, you know, 
that's where it led my mind, which is all good movies that I like. So right. <laughs> it's, it's in good company. Yeah. And then, of course, there's, there's the part where the the nice man, the, the, the guy that had the quiet man, she, she's scared to go into the to the tunnel, but it's because she doesn't, she's afraid he's going to, like, for her, that means I'm going to, like, be luring a guy to his death. And, and he's interpreting it as she's scared, and it's more like she's scared for him. So, yeah, it was just, like, little things like that that yeah. you can, you're, like, the dawning revelation of, the characters, you know, more than the characters that are on the screen, I think, is the is the general idea. Yeah. So in the story, Scar jo, who's just known as the woman or the female, drives around in a white van and seems to be looking for hapless prey. <laughs> so what are her criteria for choosing who to do what with? Like, how does she select? What are some of the things that she asks them as to, to decide if she will go forward with the choosing them for the threshing floor is that what it's called the threshing floor i'm that's just that's just what i'm calling it <laughs> oh good call um i guess as i'm talking i'll i remember that she was looking for um if somebody wasn't really up to anything in particular if they didn't have a particular destination that they were heading to um and if they had family or not or where they were from that's something she kept asking people if like you know where they were from where they're going um you know who they live with mm -hmm. are you alone mm. yeah yeah and there was um she also asked like and there was one case where the, she said uh are you going to work and he said no i work for myself and then she's like all right then <laughs> we're going to move forward you know but <laughs> um that guy will be missed we can't yeah. do that <laughs> they yeah exactly that these people are likely to not get reported yeah just, there you go that was funny like um, the guy on the beach was a perfect victim because because like he lives in a tent and like you know he was just swimming in the water the country and nobody knows where he's at and he lives in a tent he's perfect we love that mm -hmm. guy Yes, let's let's strike him with the head of the rock yeah that was such a bizarre a bizarre <laughs> scene it's like uh, yeah. that that yeah. made me it's awful but that made me chuckle i think mm -hmm. it's the way that scene was shot mm -hmm. i know that they're trying to be serious but she just stands over him for like an awkward amount of time uh, and then picks up a rock <laughs> not like a particularly big rock and just gives him a quick little and then she just drags him off and just the whole timing of it i don't i definitely don't mm. think it was meant to be comedic but it was pretty funny to me oh, filmmakers have a sense filmmakers have a sense of humor too i kind of think it's a little bit of both yeah i you know i almost thought because she does have it's a little unclear i think at first and maybe it becomes maybe it actually becomes more clear to her <laughs> but she does have a sort of moral compass or things you know things that need to happen in order like to happen for her to choose this person like she is she feels better about choosing people that are hitting on her or acting kind of sleazy and in the case of that guy you know he he just bravely goes in to save someone's life so i almost expected her to give him a pass but um but no i mean <laughs> he like he went in and tried to rescue a guy the guy goes back in to save his wife because he cares for her and i guess she went in to save their dog so it was like mm -hmm. this chain of events and the the i thought that guy she's gonna be like well wow these humans are amazing look at what he just right. tried to do I but then she too. just like conk, just knocks him over the head it seems like the only emotion she really learned was like fear because that's the only emotion you ever saw was like at the end when she starts getting attacked mm -hmm. by the logger dude that's when she starts like showing any kind of emotion which is only fear and running away from that guy so i thought it was like um i don't know i, I thought the same thing too that she was learning how to feel i think and that that definitely happens with the uh the disfigured gentleman that comes that's on the screen that's like the turning point where she mm -hmm. sees the fly banging against the window and it's like i feel bad 
or pity or whatever you would choose to call it. And then yeah, the rest of the movie is just her trying to just understand her feelings. That's right. And, after, uh, after she meets that guy, she stares in the mirror for, for five minutes. <laughs> so I think there's a direct correlation there. Like right after she meets that guy and leaves the room, she stares at herself for a long time. Right. Um, it does make me kind of wonder, though, now that hearing us talk about it in the selection process. So those questions were generally all the same for each person that she spoke to. Um, and if her, you know, unspoken mission from what we've gathered throughout watching the movie is that she's here to learn about people and learn about humans, how much information did she have prior to getting down here that she knew who to pick? Mm -hmm. Because I know that you, you guys had said something about people that were flirting with her, and maybe that's like a tiny bit of human nature that had like crept into her mm -hmm. but you see you see all the like superficial uh like showing how superficial people are and things like that mm -hmm. um oh man hold on i feel like i'm gonna go down a rabbit hole <laughs> let lead this. on lead bring on home, Nate. baby bring it home <laughs> all right all right kids um this is what we're here for <laughs> So, so she has to have had some kind of direction prior to getting down here. That's what Mr. Motorcycle Man is for. Right. He's, he's like watching over her and things like that. So somehow she had to get some kind of instruction that said, these are the people that you need to uh, abduct or whatever, you know, make meat juice out of. <laughs> so, so there's that. And in the very beginning, you kind of see like she does the little thing when she puts on the scarlet suit. Scarlet puts on the scarlet suit, right? With the little ant. Yeah, I kind I kind of wonder if that's like her um, discovering like earthly. I don't want to say consciousness. That's wrong. Uh, I don't know some kind of like empathy or something like that. And then we get down here and. We see all the people putting makeup on and that's them telling us like, hey, people just like the way they look. That's really about it. Um, how does she understand pity if she only understands everything is like these aesthetics and then she abducts the disfigured gentleman and how does that equate to, how does that equate to pity? Because she lets Guys. him go. But why does she let him go? Why doesn't she pick yeah. him? Well, I think this gets it one of the possible themes in the show, which could be sex trafficking. And I I read that and I want you guys to explain that to me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we'll get into it a little bit more later, but I think that when we when we see her when we first meet her we see we have this amazing well i think it's amazing nate would say it's too long but um we have this scene at the beginning where she's figuring out how to speak mm -hmm. and how to say words and at first it's just these incoherent syllables it's like they're calibrating almost like calibrating a machine and how do yep. we say it correctly and so then she's able to say vowels and consonants and all this all this stuff then she puts on her suit, but she is actually just like she is collecting these male prey. It's almost like she gradually gains consciousness over time, but she herself is being acted upon, right? Like this motorcycle yeah. dude is almost like her handler or her pimp. You could call him a pimp. Mm -hmm. um, and he is basically instructing her what to do. He's teaching her what, how she's supposed to act, just like the, you know, Frankenstein taught the monster how to act. And exactly, yeah. um, it's, it gets in, it can get into some really mind bending things about gaining consciousness and with the whole AI conversation going on and people fear, you know, could the AI, you know, you, you didn't ask 
if you could do it, you you didn't you, before you asked if you could do it, you didn't ask if you should do it. Dang it. Um, <laughs> famous Jurassic Park line. But I feel like when when uh, Scar Jo, when the female looks at the ant, she's like, oh, um, maybe she gradually realizes I'm the ant. And yes. that's sort of how I interpret that scene where she's staring mm -hmm. herself in the mirror because she's learning by learning to love herself. She has to then learn how to love others. As she looks at these people, she's been looking at them as outside of herself but then she in the mirror recognizes herself and there's that you which you beautifully said nate the tipping point all of a sudden she there's like a flip in her feelings about what she's doing um so i i'm just i'm drawing i know i'm drawing a big leap here but i think about how in sex trafficking people abduct women they send them out in the world to make money and they use them and uh, drug them up and their instruments and they've made the female to be a perfect weapon. They gave her the perfect hair, the perfect, they gave her this appearance that would attract men. And she doesn't, she'll just be driving around in the van and they just come up and knock on the door or give her flowers. And um, so it's easy for her to attract these people, but she's being used and it's not clear. Yeah. It's not clear what the motive is. Is she's, is she's there to learn how humans interact or is she there to destroy humans and specifically men? Hmm. There's a lot to think about. It is, I guess I'll go now and I'll start with the ant. And I think mm -hmm. that's spot on. I think that the ant was put there for a reason that, that she and the motorcycle dude are part of like an insect hive and like an insect hive. They both have like their different, um, different jobs. So mm -hmm. she's a gatherer and he's like a, I don't know, a fighter worker. I'm, I'm not sure what he is exactly, but he helps her. He's like an assistant maybe. And I didn't see it more as sex trafficking. I guess I saw them as, um, harvesting like skin so that they could blend in like underneath both of them I assume are like you know that pure black form mm -hmm. and so I also assume there's more than just two of them and so the, I think that their job is just to get as, as many victims as they can with skin and that's what their like their job I can, I totally see your, your parallel to sex trafficking. Absolutely. I just never, I didn't see it that way. I saw them as like an insect hive doing their thing. And I hate to say it, um, you know, Adam Pearson, the disfigured guy you're talking about, he did like a, a brave thing coming on this film and, you know, exposing stuff about himself. He's been in like lots of other things too. And he's an Instagram influencer. He posts every day and, um, you know, he just unfortunately has this disease. Um, but uh, all that being said, that's kind of what I took from it is that she felt pity for the guy. She learned to feel emotions for people. She took pity because he was sad, obviously sad. And obviously, you know, she's look based because, you know, she's looking for skin. She's looking for certain people and um, everybody's making comments about her looks and stuff. So she's aware of like looks so I, I think that she rejected um, our guy. I think that she rejected Adam. And then she went out in the mirror and looked at herself. And that's exactly like you said, Nate, that's when she started like, you know, he was him. I, me, what am I doing? And <laughs> it seems like that's when she started feeling. And yeah, maybe that's an unpopular opinion, but that's kind of what, what I was thinking when that happened. What do you hmm. mean she reject, rejected him? he he was in the water he was getting ready to go in the black water to be preserved so she selected his... him for the threshing floor yes when you said rejected i was like she decided not to kill him and i was like no she was she was going to she was then, going to yeah. right and then she had some sort of, sort of mind change and did mm -hmm. not so that's what i mean by rejecting him like nope i'm not going to do this um yeah. for two for two reasons you know multiple reasons yeah I actually wondered in mm -hmm. during his scene, I wondered if um, 
if she even understands the concept of a disfigurement because she doesn't stare at him or you know she's just like why don't you have a girlfriend and when has anybody ever touched you and when's the last time you were touched and so um I'm not sure if she got the concept but she did she did feel his emotions she did feel he was sad and was trying to cheer him up but I didn't necessarily um you know and she was but she was just talking to him like anybody else she would talk to anybody else she didn't um she wasn't necessarily nicer to him although right. she did make sure she gave him a compliment so it was i don't know it was it was hard to tell with that if she was um trying to be nice to him or if she was treating him just like she would any other person what are your thoughts nate i guess i'm trying to understand why she would even initiate to have part of the selection process or like why she would even consider him for the selection process rather because we've seen so many other examples of people Mm -hmm. and her understanding of looks and things like that and in that if she was truly on a mission to do something why would she even waste her time for that um so something makes me feel like it was just shoved in there to create a tipping point in the movie and fair um t- try a non-traditional alien movie where it's not just going to be about probing and things like that it's now it's about humanity whatever that means mm. it was a conscious choice to like you know hire adam for the role and there was like right. you know, a, a conscious you know So I think there was like a checkpoint of things he wanted to do, wanted Mm -hmm. to have Scarlett Johansson to get eyeballs on it, wanted to like, you know, give Adam a platform, wanted to do some cool stuff outside, you know, (laughs) he wanted to hire, you know. I I really think that this movie does a pretty traditional path of like, you start out not really knowing a whole lot about, about your antagonist. Right? Would she be the antagonist, or is she more the protagonist? Is there a pro- I would is there say an she's antagonist? More, I would say she's more the protagonist, and the guy on the bike is the antagonist, and oh. Mister Yellow Vest Man. Oh, yeah. So, like, we kind of start off where, like, we kind of see how awful she is all the way up through the movie, and then we hit this goody two shoes moment. And then we do some things that are in the goody two shoes realm. And then we just dive down into depravity right? with the logger and things like that. And then we just jump completely off the cliff and we just set someone on fire. So spoilers, kids, Mm -hmm. but. Yeah. Yeah. They played with our emotions. I mean, they, we didn't like her this whole movie basically. Or we were like, we're figuring her out. And then all of a sudden we see her fear. We see what this guy is like violently attacking her. It's like, oh my God, I actually feel for this person now. She looks terrified and I don't want this to happen to her. So they, yeah, they, they messed with us. <laughs> they succeeded. I like. Do you her. think it's to show, do you think it's to show us that everything feels fear? Yeah. I, I mean, there's, there's no, there's no right, there's no right answer, but, um, you know, I, I liked her character. I think, you know, we, maybe it was because it's Scarlett Johansson. I mean, we like people that are pretty. And so it's like, she's walking around basically getting rid of, of jerks. So why do I care? Um, Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, and, and it is interesting. I, I do wonder too, like if men and women have different, you know, ways they react to this film yes um but as i i so i was like the way i saw it she's learning how to how humans act and so she's learning from the humans both the good and the good good and the bad qualities of humans she gets meets some jerks that she gets rid of we aren't really too upset about it until we see what happens to the guys and then we kind of feel you know slightly sorry for them um mm-hmm. and then she's then she goes through this process of um of learning 
how not everybody, maybe these people don't deserve to die, you know? So then she's, she's changing her mind. She meets this, she meets her new friend and, and he's, he's treating her really nice. And well, I mean, she meets a new friend. It's like, yeah, she doesn't I know, know what I, sex is. Um, and I'm the, giggling because so, it's funny. <laughs> and then when she, towards the end, when she goes to the woods, she at that point has, she's run away from her handler, right? She's sort of decided, yes. I don't want to kill people anymore. Only, unfortunately, the first person she comes across just happens to be a real asshole. <laughs> um, so then it's almost like the risks of, not killing people you know she decides not to be the predator and then she's turned into the prey and so it's 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 an interesting path but what is the overall message of the movie i mean who knows but it's like you know the way that the way that uh the female is left it's not it's not good she was turning over her wicked ways and she gets uh she gets violated and and screwed over and and um yeah in in the woods it's like the natural the beauty the natural setting right um so it's yeah that that's like my overall take and the plot what do you guys think well i feel like i gave my my overall feeling and my synopsis of the plot so you go Okay, yeah, I I saw it as like I guess like I said like um, them learning the lay of the land and she inadvertently catches feelings along the way, and like you, the ending confounded me. I wasn't quite sure what to take take away from the ending of it. I know the motorcycle man is still out there, so he's probably going to find another partner eventually. Um, mm-hmm. But I took away from it like um, definitely like a gender reversal. I did know. I, absolutely was aware that she was driving around in the van having an easy time talking to people having an easy time having people come get in the van with her um and i immediately thought you know if that was like even if it was just a male a good looking male um that that would be like such a bad sign bad um bad Mm -hmm. vibes all around and like you said we're um almost conditioned to like scarlett johannesson um, just on site, you know, I think she was cast for that reason because she's a likable person. And like when she smiles, it like lights up her whole face. She looks very friendly. So you want to trust her. But when I say like, um, <laughs> you know, th- she's evil because of her, you know, skin harvesting tricks and, you know, anybody who's keeping people victim in the basement is is evil in my eyes i'm sorry that's a red flag so i i I assumed that she was evil and i didn't like her the whole time until and i didn't even like her when she was hanging out with the guy the dude that she was like trying to live with or something and Mm. she was being so blank like so blank so i was getting nothing from her so i didn't feel like this connection to her until the end when she started being fear and then i was like oh i i really feel something for you now So that's what I took from it. Like, you know, everybody has, you know, fear. Like you said, Nate, I think you said it. Like everybody can feel a little fear every now and then. Um, You can feel like we talked in dark. We talked about Bartosh. We didn't like Bartosh, but then we kind of feel bad for Bartosh because nobody's hanging out with them. So, you know, you got to feel for these people sometimes. Even the evil basement killers. Mm Mm-hmm. And there was the, um, you know, the man, I guess the blogger, the man. Now he was trying to assault her, but what were his reasons for killing her? I guess he was afraid, you know, xenophobia. Because like, yeah. I didn't get it. Like he, he was supposed yeah. to be like a figure of safety because he has a safety vest. He's a logger. He's got his equipment out there. He's supposed to make you feel safe. And at first he's asking her questions. It seems like he's concerned for her. But when I watched it the second time here, like his questions were more like probing, like, are you here alone where I can assault you? Mm -hmm. So the, they're almost the same questions that she asked. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh Oh, there you go. I did not notice that. Bingo. (laughs) Went right over my head. Jesus Christ. (laughs) Yeah. That uh, good call, Nate. I definitely, I noticed that and I thought it was, it was really creepy, but you're kind of, 
Yeah, it was it wasn't clear. I guess yeah, her her mental state was so out of whack, out of running yeah, from was. this from the motorcycle guy that her just antenna were not up to like notice what this guy was doing, but he was the absolute <laughs> worst. I thought of him as like he's the worst guy we've met yet because he just started like mansplaining, you know, this is a nice place to walk in the woods and are you alone? And he just didn't even take a breath and he's wearing this yellow vest and it's basically like danger, 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 run away right now. <laughs> um, I mean, I know yeah. why he attacked her in the shelter because she's easy prey. There's nowhere for her to go. But like when she ran off, I wasn't really clear why he like so violently ran at, you know, like, I guess he I guess his intention was to kill her after he was done it must have been um because otherwise you know when she ran off from the shelter he would have let her go I'm just I don't know <laughs> and I got something yeah go ahead Nate I got, let's let's have a little moral debate great oh gosh <laughs> so the logger obviously does some terrible things right mm-hmm how is that any different from what she did in the beginning of the movie? And so if like the way that we've spoken about everything is that as soon as we started talking about the logger, it's he's awful. We hate him, all these other kinds of things, but we, and partially that is because, you know, well, not partially it's because he sexually assaulted her. That's, that's the big thing. But I mean, in the very beginning, she lures guys into her van and then takes them to a dark room, gets half naked and tells them, get in this water, man. And then we move on to the next thing. And while it's not, I think, as graphic as the um, logger scene, it's the same concept. Yeah. Essentially. Lu- essentially. She's luring and, them and he's forcing her. Yeah. And it's like, what's the phrase? It's so simple. Of uh, the the hunter is now the hunted. <laughs> yeah. Right. I just I think that that's. I guess in hearing myself say it out loud now, it is a good way to end the movie. As awful of a concept as it is, I mean, it's it's just awful. Um, mm-hmm all the way around but i i i guess you're right steve uh maybe his intent was to kill her the entire time also he must run really fast to be able to run all the way back to get his gas Gas. can and ran all the way back while she's just sitting there looking at her at her skin i was like wow with this movie's pacing that should have been like a (laughs) 15 minute scene I was like, he did this yep. in 30 yeah, seconds. The, going back to your point about um, double standards, I guess. Um, you know, one of the one of the critics did that I saw did talk about this as being reverse rape culture, they called it, where um, in rape culture, it's always the men with the power. And, you know, in this case, because she's a female, it's easy for them to go willingly and they they do they think they think they're going into a consensual sex act only they go into the the fun house <laughs> and go into the black goo and get harvested for for meat and in skin suits which i didn't think about that part which makes it even more horrible but um <laughs> i think that it's because of the, the structure in the world is that the men are men have historically been able to force themselves upon women because of their superior physical strength. And that that's like their trump card every time. So I'm not saying she's more moral, but she does. She also doesn't exactly seem to know what she's doing either. And, and in fact, one of the things, the one, the, the, one of the other points I wanna make 
not to get a, not saying we have to leave this point, but it did seem that sometimes she was very, could be very charming. Like when she oh, was yeah. talking to the men, she had this, a very natural way of speaking, but then there are other times where she's ro completely robotic and awkward. Mm -hmm. So I mm -hmm. thought that was an interesting change to see and wondering how, what caused her to act one way or the other. I think like I have an answer for that. What triggered those things? Yeah, go ahead, Steve. When she was being charming, she had a she had a mission to pick up the guys. Um, it was part of her job. Um, when she was being robotic is when she was like not doing her job. When she was with that one guy and she was trying to be like a normal Scotland lady and live in the house and have sex with the. Um, she was being super robotic there because she didn't have an agenda. She didn't really know what to do. There was um, no plan. Yeah. So there was she... no script to follow. <laughs> Come on, Glazer, give us a script. Um, but yeah, I think I think that's you know that that's why. Right. But even the, before the there's this charm. there's the scene where she trips on the sidewalk and people are right. trying to, you know, people like go to help her. And if she, she was in the car, react. if she was in the car, she would be like Oh, well, thank you. Thank you so much. And where are you going? Where are you off to? Because they were like, you know, three <laughs> That's different things around was, her. She was good at like making up conversation. I, I guess that like short circuits her brain when she's in situations where she's not sure what to do. Like there's just so many options. She just short circuits and does nothing. Mm -hmm. Like she was just laying on the ground for like a minute before they picked her up. And then, yeah, <laughs> I forgot about that scene. She just like walked straight off. I rewound that scene a couple of times to like watch all the passerbys and like what they did and how they reacted. That was a, that was a funny scene too. Got to admit. <laughs> so were there any scenes that really stuck out to you? And um, Steve, you want to, you were mentioning the cake scene before. I know you already <laughs> mentioned that briefly. Did you want to yeah. say anything else about that? Um, no, I think I already did say what I was going to mm -hmm. say about that, but the, um, the, how she decides to be intimate with the guy, that big weird kiss. And that was, that was all pretty hilarious. I got to admit that she didn't know what she was doing. And yeah, eventually she ran out of there. Um, well, that was interesting too, the, 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 the sex scene, right? I mean, they start to do it and, and then she's like, she grabs the lamp and is looking at herself like. She I, I didn't know what to think of that. I didn't either. I guess she doesn't like things being entered into her body, like the cake or like sex. She doesn't want anything in there. Mm. Um, it just re She just rejects everything. Maybe her body doesn't, you know, her real body doesn't accept anything like that. <laughs> mm. I don't know, but yeah, yeah those were true. really interesting scenes. Um, but yeah, I, th I think we pretty much touched on all like the most interesting scenes, I guess. Um, no. No? I think we've forgotten one major one. Uh-oh, okay. <laughs> there might be more, but go ahead, I'm Nate. sure there is. Oh, uh, there probably is more. Um, motorcycle man giving her the stare down. <laughs> yeah. Showdown time. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Making sure that she's still on mission. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's when I thought they were the most insect-like. Like it looked like they were communicating like via their antennas, like instead of with words or anything else. Yeah. That I scene threw me off a little bit because um, the cutting is weird. She has a guy that she's picked up. Right. And they go to the house and she does the thing where she turns around and he goes to follow after her. And then it cuts to like the guy on the bike. Yep. And so I thought that that guy was the other guy, you know, like Me I got too. confused and then Same. I noticed, no, it's the, it's, he's wearing the backpack and he's got the suit on the bike suit, the racer suit. Um, so yeah, it was, I, I did want to talk about his character and the way that he acted. So yeah. What, what do you, what did you notice about his performance, Nate? <laughs> oh, just how serious and authoritative I thought it was mm -hmm. and whichever one of you had initially said that he is essentially her handler mm -hmm. is that was probably the best and most accurate thing that 
represents that that scene and the re- and the relationship between them. Mm-hmm. And I wish that that would have been explored a little bit more throughout mm-hmm. the movie. I think that would have given it a really cool dynamic. Yeah. Um, but that was really about it. Mm-hmm. I wonder if yeah, that was the relationship, just what we yeah. saw them staring at each other for five minutes. That's what they do. <laughs> That's how they talk to each other. Steve, you he and I are to... going to go back. Go ahead, I'm Nate. sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, Steve, you and I are going to go back through this movie each on our own time, and we're going to have a stop clock with us. Okay. And every, every moment that we're not seeing anything <laughs> <laughs> move, we start the timer. Right. The movie is an hour and 48 minutes long. Okay. I'm going to argue that at least, <laughs> at least 53 minutes of it is just harsh wind noises mm-hmm. <laughs> and still frames that aren't really still. Um, it, it, I'm kind of surprised you, you're saying this, Nate, because I was imagining you saying we will never watch this again. But no, you're going to do it just so you can you can out, of, put this out of spite. It'll be it'll be like a like a 10 minute episode of this podcast just for us to give the viewers and the listeners our findings. And once we do have that finding, we have that amount of time where um, we're going to make a podcast of silence and then of that amount of time for 53 minutes of like harsh noise, silence. And it's speech. actually, hmm? sorry, I was going to say, it's just you and I blowing into a mic. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Send that to Jonathan Glazier. So you got to sit through this now. <laughs> hey, man, can you put a movie in front of this? The, the, the man on the bike he is an interesting figure because he yeah. uh, he also has to clean up her messes you know if, if she doesn't oh, fulfill the does. mission doesn't he? you know with the the guy the man with the deformities um he ends up ha- he like goes to his house and just as the poor guy finds, <laughs> he's but he ran home naked and just <laughs> as soon as he runs in the guy is there to uh to pick him up and and say, "Ho ho! You thought you got away, but you did not. You did not escape the wrath of the bike man." Yep. Do we have a section for complaints? I mean, the whole th- this whole this whole podcast has been. Nate, you probably... made plenty of complaints. Well, hold on. I have one big one. <laughs> what that hasn't been said yet? Okay. Yeah, it oh. hasn't been said yet. Okay, go ahead. I'm gonna I'm gonna write down what my point is gonna be so I don't forget. Okay, All right. Go ahead. My biggest complaint <laughs> is Scottish people. Oh my god! If, <laughs> if, what? No, 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 no. Accents. <laughs> Love it. Look, look, look. If you were gonna, if you were, you're an alien floating up in you know outer space, and you're like, we're going to Earth, and you have all this technology to monitor the human race and all the thousands and variants of languages and cultures and peoples who who was the one that was like i want to go to the most unintelligible part of the whole world where it rains all the time we're going to scotland guys (laughs) like i just can't I just couldn't understand anybody. And, you know, it's true. Poor decision on my part to not put on subtitles. But, like, I. It was a different language. It was like, yes. a, it was a, it's, it's a different language. And it's like a guess and check every time that they said something. I was like, oh, what did they say? And then I was just hoping that Scarlett could put together something coherent enough to. <laughs> give me context clues for what they said. And then if I didn't understand, I was like, okay, they made it in the van or no, they didn't make it in the van. All right. Mm. (laughs) I just, and it's not a complaint. It's more just like (laughs) me being goofy. I mean, it's definitely a better choice than, you know, dropping down in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. (laughs) I have no idea what the bus driver said. Not a, not even, not even a little bit. Besides, yeah. I heard something about a coat. Yeah, he asked then, her if she had a coat and a hat. She must be very cold. 
um you know she 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 needs to get warm stuff on yeah and then she told uh, the other guy to to leave her alone because yeah. she doesn't want to talk to you i um i i disagree because i thought like the scenery and like the location of scotland was city you got the suburbs you got the country you got the beach you got the forest you got all these different you got a mall she's like in a club she gets to experience like all these different things. And I think like Scotland's a good small place to make that happen. But yes, those accents were driving me insane as well. And I was just wondering how anybody could even get by life without subtitles in the real world walking around Scotland. I don't know how <laughs> they can do it. Lindsay, mm-hmm. how'd you do it? Yeah. <laughs> I use subtitles. <laughs> oh, oh, you mean, oh, you in mean. Real life. <laughs> When he's right there in front of you, you can't do that. Just, yeah, please. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you, uh, you know, you just have to repeat or you just ask questions. You say like, oh, what does that phrase mean? Because I don't hear that. But you do it in a flirtatious way because it's fun. Um, but they ask you to repeat things too or make fun of, of things that you say just as much. Oh, yeah. Like I talked... I once asked a guy, I told him that I really like, he was wearing a houndstooth coat, which I really liked. And I was like, wow, I really love your jacket because I have a pair of pants that are houndstooth. And he said, that's the first time that someone's told me what color their knickers are the first time I met them or something, you know? So I was like, pants (laughs) is underwear there. Yeah, so that's, um, yeah, so. (laughs) Anywho's, you're a very forward mm. person, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> um, so the one aspect I wanted to talk about, which goes hand in hand with sort of some of the things you've been talking about, which is like not much happening and some of you know the sound choices. But I, I was I was thinking that really this movie is almost wordless, right? There's mm-hmm. not much dialogue or script there i mean there's a script but there's not much dialogue and most of it is unintelligible to nate but (laughs) um i found that to be an impressive part of the movie because so much of what scarlett johansson does with her role is done through body language and just whether she's acting she's has that sort of muted non-emotive thing or she's not putting on her charm or the way she walks from point a to point b um there's a lot of what she's doing it's, it's a very physical performance for her um and you know i i found that to be an interesting choice because a lot of movies can be over scripted or over explained and that and that really gets on my nerves but it did strike me that if it weren't for the music but silent movies had music. I don't know. It was. It would almost. It could almost be a silent movie where nobody says anything the whole movie, and you would still get the meaning of what was going on without hearing from that bus driver, or right. you know what, what that dude said. You could almost watch the whole thing on um, on mute. Yeah, like do like listen to like the newest Bell Witch album, like as like an hour and a half like like funeral doom and watch this movie problem. with the sound turned down that would be a great time you're right about that because yeah even the dialogue that is spoken could be easily like deterred just from body language gestures and where the scenes lead you yeah you're right this is a silent film by all by all stretch of the imagination um the other role she did this year 2013 she also did her this same year where she did nothing but like an audio performance where she only did voice and she was only like a voice, but she was like the main character of the movie as her voice. So that's kind of interesting that those are two different <laughs> movies that she did that year. Mm. Nate would probably like the movie better if he, he chose his own soundtrack, right? Is that what you're going to say, Nate, to like, just watch it with the music of your choice? No, I, some of the music was pretty interesting from you know when you could hear it over the wind (laughs) or the the grass rustling it was pretty interesting um but 
I don't, yeah, like I almost would have preferred it to just be silent. Mm. Just because you, you are, you are hundred percent correct. She did do a lot of acting with her body language. Um, I don't know if you want to call staring at the camera acting. <laughs> I wish that there was a little something that went along with that, like mm. anything. But yeah, there's you know the movie all. Metropolis. The movie Metropolis is famous for that. We they've lost the original score, so tons of people have scored that movie. Um, the film's music composer is Micah Levi with a stage name of Michahu. Um, so uh, first, I think this is the first score that they made. They, they have they, them pronouns. Um, but it was, yeah, it was an interesting score. The, the score was praised, but, and I remembered really liking the music, but it is very, very minimal and muted again. Yeah. Sometimes it's just a drum beat, you know, or they had violin, they had string instruments. And it kind of reminded me of that, the soundtrack from, that movie I had you watch, Steve, and you didn't like it, The Wonder. Mm -hmm. It was just kind of like, sometimes it'd be like, it's almost sound like a slide whistle. Mm -hmm. You know, just like these little, <laughs> um, almost like back side sound effects, almost rather than um, music. And I mean, it's, a, it's an effective score. Nate's called it interesting. So that's good. You know, it's like, it seems like a little better than maybe other aspects you like interesting usually means good or at least worth thinking about yeah yeah it was good subtle it was good and it was nice and subtle mm -hmm. that's right didn't overdo their job at all um fit right in there nice i looked i looked them up too because i wanted to see what other kind of kind of stuff they had and i came up pretty empty um mm -hmm. <laughs> I did look up a bunch of uh, Jonathan Glazer stuff. Is it okay, to, appropriate time to see what I found with this guy? He's he's yeah, made sure. a couple. <clears throat> he's made a couple of films, but I'm more drawn to like the uh, the music videos that he's done. He's done Dead Weathers, um, Treat Me Like Your Mother. It's a video like with Jack White and like the band is like getting like blown up as they're performing, like getting shot multiple times, and it's a wild video. He did like the uncle video for um, Tom York, uh, Rabbit in Your Headlights, which would like won a lot of awards and Karma Police by Radiohead. He's done Blur, Massive Attack. I believe these are the reasons that Scarlett Johansson is in this movie is because of his association with these bands. And she's a, a real indie kind of person who's into like the indie scene and indie bands. Um, I have like a personal, like I don't, I've never met her and I don't know anything about her, but I have like one of these like third hand accounts of um, y'all know Marshland monster James. And then mm -hmm. he does the stuff with dragon boy suede um, dragon boy suede at one time was like dating, I think Michelle Rodriguez and she and like Josh Scarlett Johansson's old boyfriend, Josh, I want to say Josh Brolin, but that's not right. Um, they all went out one night and like Michelle and Josh were like buddies. So they like, they were hanging out and then like, you know, Scarlett and Howard were like the other people that were there. Um, and, you know, Howard talks about on his podcast, how much of a great time he had that he, the way he tells it, they talked like for hours about nothing but music and they were all into the same stuff. And like, they, I think they kept in touch and like, he just absolutely adores her. So because he talks about that so affectionately. I'm like, oh, she's great. <laughs> so ever since I've heard about that, I've always thought she was kind of cool too because she got the stamp of approval from Dragon Boy Suede. Um, I liked her in Ghost World. That's the first thing I noticed her in, um, which mm -hmm. is also like a hipster kind of movie that, you know, I don't know. So I do, I do believe that that's why she's in this movie, not to like downplay anything, but I think that you know, they say in Hollywood, you do one for them and one for you. And this is the one for you that's, that Scarlett did. Mm -hmm. It is interesting that now I feel like people are, when you look at indie movies, a lot of times they're casting unknown actors 
mm-hmm. trying to trying to introduce people to the world. Right. And so often I'll see somebody do a great performance, but then they're not really in anything else um, for for a while. Whereas back when this movie was made, which is 2013, in order for an indie film to get watched, you had to sort of have that star or celebrity mm-hmm. pull. Otherwise, nobody would watch it. Now, A24 has a name. They, they have the A24 stands. And, and so if you, get, if you have that A24 label, that's usually enough for many people to watch the movie. But back... Yeah, back when before that, you had to sort of have that celebrity pull in there. And many people were considered for this role. In fact, I read that originally they were going to make it closer to the book. And then uh, Brad Pitt was going to play a role. Mm -hmm. There was going to be a male and a female. And they decided to get rid of every scene that included the male. They just wanted the female alien to be to be in the movie and so that's that's why scarlett johansson is is front and center but um it yeah it is interesting how back in this time that you have a celebrity being in an a24 movie and this being just i think the seventh movie they ever did so this was all so very new i think that Pretty much covers everything I wanted to say. And is there are there other other points that you guys want to make about this movie? No, I feel like I've talked more more tonight than I did in any of our podcasts with just Steve <laughs> and I. Yeah, it was great. I love how you. Uh, I appreciate you talking about a movie that you hated. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, I think we talked much more in our 1899 retrospective. I wanted to say, I wanted to um, give y'all the, the tell, tell you about Adam Pearson, what I learned about him. Mm. But first, should should we like? I just, I was just on a podcast last night, and they did like the Rotten Tomatoes scores, and we, we we took our four scores, and then we like you know did like our critics critics you know average or whatever. Mm. Are you guys interested in doing that? We can, if you guys would want to do that. Because I, I thought about this already. Um, so I'm already ready to go with my score. And y'all can base it <laughs> so on So you want to do a percentage? Is that what you're saying? A percentage whatever out of 100? You, yeah, whatever. You, I mean, you know, that can that's work fine. the same it's way. E- anyway. That's easier mathematically than exactly. doing four out of, you know, five stars or whatever. So go yeah, ahead, was, Steve. Give, yeah. give Nate a chance to think and I'll think about it too. Well, I'll tell you at first I was, um, was going to score it kind of low but then i was thinking like it's like a teacher like i was looking at this as like an art film school art school film i was like i definitely wouldn't fail um uh, mr glazer for this project definitely not and i don't even i don't even, not even sure if it deserves a c but i think it should at least get like a c plus which i'm pretty sure a c plus is like an 80 um i think i want to score it just under that so i'm going to say i'm going to give it a 78 because I actually, like I said, I'm glad I saw this movie. Probably not going to watch it again. But there's things I liked about it. And um, so, I mean, we're talking about it. That forced us to kind of like it and analyze it. But even so, I'm glad I did. So that's my score. 78. Mm-hmm. Nate, are you ready? Or do you do want me to go? All right. I'll go. I'm going to get, so just thinking about it now, uh, I thought about it as mostly re I love rewatching movies. And a big thing for me is this is not a movie that I would voluntarily rewatch unless that there was like mm-hmm. a purpose for it. Like right. in 20 years when we all get together and we go, oh, remember that time that we watched that movie? I'll rewatch it and go, it's still bad. So I'm gonna I'm gonna give this movie. I'm gonna give this movie a 40. Ooh, okay. 40%. Mm-hmm. 40 is down there. I mean, yeah, the, some of these Mandarin shots, Mr. Glazier, minus five points. Um, <laughs> shots of the clouds, minus 10 points. Okay, I see. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I got 70, um... got 80. Yeah, I think I'm going to do 
75 is going to be my score. Okay. I was I was going to give it 80, but then I realized, well, that's four out of five and right. that's a high movie. And I, as much as I appreciate the movie and appreciate the artistry in it, it does have some things that I can see, you know, it is a little um, rough. I will say that's the word I'm going to use a little rough yeah. around the edges. But definitely an interesting movie that obviously I could I could talk about for a long time. <laughs> I could too. I could I could, I could also still could keep going. I think I am. So that gives us a critics average of sixty four. So all in all, sounds like I, I guess that's what is that like a D? I don't know if that's an F yeah. or not, but yeah, that's a D. Okay, well, yeah, you can you can still graduate, Jonathan Glazer. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Um, what I learned about Adam Pearson is he's pretty young. He's right. When he said he's 26, um, he was born in 85, um, which makes him more than 26. But, but you know, he's not an old guy. Uh, he's got a twin brother. They were both born um, with, this with this disorder, which is called neurofibromatosis. And it's like a neurological disorder where like your scar tissue doesn't heal properly. So they were both born looking identical. Um, and when Adam was five, he bumped his head, got a big thing on his head, which grew into like what you see now, like, you know, that j it just kept growing and it's painless. Um, but even so that's how that happened. It's just a simple bump on his head. And because of this disorder, it turned, you know, turned that, in, turned that into that. And there's pictures on Wikipedia. You look up Adam Pearson and there's pictures of him and his twin brother. And you can see the resemblance. You can see, you know, exactly what, you know, Adam would look like if he hadn't had that operation. And that's what he talks about. And like, he does like a Ted talk where he talks about that too. A really articulate guy, really funny too. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to bring that up. He wasn't born like that. That was, that was an, a small accident that happened when he was a child. Yeah. <laughs> you mentioned some of glazer's music videos but what i what i always look at is i go oh he directed that movie sexy beast with ben kingsley oh, that i've never seen before i missed but, that that's a good movie i liked it <laughs> but i remember that was early this was you know around the time when i was becoming very very devoted to watching the academy awards and i remember them uh i believe that movie came out in 2000 so Sounds it was like still it. a little a little bit after a little bit after college for me and I remember watching the the Academy Awards and they always show a scene of the person and Ben Kingsley, Sir Ben Kingsley is is uh, giving, you know, he got nominated for an Oscar for that role. So that that's definitely a movie I always wanted to see. And that was that was Glazer's first movie. Um, so it's Kingsley was intense in that movie. I mean, watching that movie made you very nervous it like made you like afraid that ben kingsley was going to jump out of the screen and like kick your ass i mean it was a really intense movie um i remember liking it a lot and feeling weird watching it too it was like one of those kind of movies <laughs> <laughs> well i guess that's glazer's brand making I you guess. feel weird <laughs> yep. well should we do some shout outs before we close talk about sure like Shout Where them out. Find each other. Okay, yeah. I'm gonna let you go first, Nate. Oh, geez. Uh -huh. <clears throat> right, don't do cool the kids. lean back too. Don't do the lean back yet. <laughs> no. All right, cool kids. Um, you can find me on the interwebs slash no, I'm just kidding. Uh Instagram at void.master and uh Things are a little slow right now with being out here in Pittsburgh, but you know, summer's rolling around and we're looking to try and get out there and play some gigs. And uh, I guess we'll, we'll figure it out from there. Um, hit us up, send us a message, tell us, hey, you talk way too much or you say some goofy things or whatever. And uh, make sure that you keep listening to Lindsay and Steve and all their, their podcast nonsense. Their misadventures, if you will. Nonsense isn't what I wanted. Misadventures. And hopefully they'll have me back on here at some point to 
harass them about other things and give them my perpetual negativity. Yeah. So. Well, thanks for that shout out, Nate. I do want to say also that Lloyd Master Nate has quite a creative bent. So um, he's known to just, he will go on and whip up a song in one evening. So if you have any... If you have any like song needs, um, you could probably, especially the, maybe this would be a good time to to hit Nate up because he's in between projects right now. Yeah, yeah, hit me up if you got music that you want. You know, you want me to look at and do some kind of mix, master, re-record, add something, take something away, whatever you want. Or hey, if you just want to talk about music, send me a message and say what do you want to talk about? And I'll say, yeah, hell, I don't know. You pick <laughs> something like that. I think I'm a lot funnier than I, I really am. <laughs> we think yeah, you're we're not very laughing. funny. <laughs> we're not laughing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, so go ahead, Steve. I'll vouch for Nate because the reason I know him is because I was a fan of his music before I even met him or knew that he was a person named Nate. I was just listening to some band called void master and they ripped. Um, so it's like some good doom metal. So anyway, I'm also a musician. Um, my band is intro void. It's intro dot void. And I put stuff out. I try to put out a song every month. I do have a song now that is complete except for the drums and the vocals. And I attempted vocals today, Nate, and it went awful. I hate my voice. My voice does not work for this song. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to release a song nonetheless at some point, probably without my vocals. Um, but the main thing I do is a podcast with these two individuals over here. Um, I have Sweet Child of Time. It's a recap podcast I do. And Nate and myself have recapped all the episodes of 1899. Lindsay and myself are in the process of recapping Dark. Um, James and myself have recapped uh, Wheel of Time. At first I was doing like recaps, like of Wheel of Time and then I wouldn't do anything. And then I would, my point is it's gonna be a weekly podcast from here on out. Even if I uh, run out of episodes of Dark with Lindsay or if Lindsay needs to take a week off, I'm still gonna hop on the mic with either Nate over there or James or pull in Heather or Titanosaur or somebody. Um, I'm gonna do something every week. So sweet child of time, that's the thing. That's where Lindsay is too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Steve's also guesting on many podcasts um, this week. He had like four different podcasts. So that's right. Yep, yep, including this one, which is yeah, one of my this stories. One before, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and like Steve said, we are recapping dark every week and releasing those episodes on both of our channels. I also have a YouTube channel where you can see it in video. If you want pictures that match, I wasn't going to do that, but now that I'm doing it, I like it. And so I'm going to keep doing it. So uh, those come with visuals, still images that you can, you can see. So sometimes if I pointed something out, the image appears right there next to it as we're talking, which is nice. I like but it. I also review movies on a regular basis, and you probably already know that because you're watching this on my YouTube channel or you're listening <laughs> to my podcast, so I'm not going to say too much about me, but that's it for me tonight. And um, yeah. Thank you for bringing us all together. I appreciate it. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. This, is, this was a lot of fun. Much needed. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So everybody we're gonna sign off now and we hope you have that you find plenty of water and shade oh, as hmm. steve says yeah copyright infringement <laughs> yeah i hope you find a white van to ride around in that's what i'll say instead i'm bringing the free candy i hope you find some skin to wear Ooh. <laughs> i hope you find a meat meat uh goo meat, i don't know <laughs> meat conveyor a meat conveyor belt yes all right okay. i'm gonna yeah good night everybody <laughs> gonna, we enjoyed right. it. <laughs>